uh, the New Testament authors found their source code, their foundation to be able to preach the fact, even unto death, that Jesus the Nazarene was God. They preached that because they found that truth embedded in the Old Testament scriptures and then revealed to them, explained to them, and exposited to them by the Lord Jesus himself, by the Holy Spirit, and in and through the life and ministry of Jesus. This is where this truth is found. We find ourselves in Hebrews chapter 1 today as uh, we ha- in our third sermon in this series where the writer, is it Paul? Who knows? I think it's probably Paul who preached it and somebody wrote down the sermon and sent it out. And the big motivation is this. Jesus is better. Jesus is more superior. Jesus is supreme over anything and everything that you might give your soul, your hope, your trust, your life to or your worship to. Jesus is God in flesh, ascended to receive all worship and glory and honor. And it, is the, it was the early Christians who faced the temptation, the stress, the, uh, uh, the, the drifting, uh, backsliding tendency to go and find themselves hiding within the external national Jewish religion who alone had uh, freedom of religion from the Romans so as to escape from a uh, persecution that was coming from the heavy-handed Roman Empire. But it wasn't just that. It was also that uh, the, the Jewish religion had much to, on a human level, it had much to boast of in terms of its, uh, its pomp, uh, its tradition, its legacy, its heritage. There was much about it that early Christians, if they were, they were held up to the uh, option of keep going to church and be hunted down, beheaded, crucified, burned alive, flayed, speared, thrown amongst the gladiators and the lions in the Colosseum and die... Or worship Jesus in your heart and stay at synagogue. Go to temple and worship there secretly. There was a a drifting, a uh, backsliding, a cowardly tendency among early Christians, which we understand but we do not commend, to find uh, 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 in the Old Testament, kind of, and the Old Testament system and the Old Covenant worship, enough. I mean, it's enough. It's, it's not everything, and maybe they don't worship Jesus explicitly, but you know, it's enough. It's glorious. It's amazing. And one of those, those things that would uh, uh, dial them back and tempt them back and lure Christians to be uh, maybe Gentile Christians who were just getting all amped up with the pomp of the Old Testament system, or maybe it was formal Jew, former Jews who had become Christians who were being called back to their roots, the temptation was this. It, Jesus has to compete with Moses, and for a guy raised a Jew, that's a hard sell. Jesus has to compete with uh, David. He's the greatest king ever. That's a hard sell. Jesus has to compete. If we're going to leave all this for him, he has to compete with angels, and that's a hard sell. So basically, the the main idea of today's passage that we're going to read, it's going to be from chapter 1, verse 4 almost all the way through to chapter 2, verse 16, that we're not going to read and exposit every line of it. But the main idea that that drives throughout these verses is that Jesus is supreme over angels. So let's read it, and then we'll go into why that's such a big deal. Chapter 1, verse 4 says that Jesus has become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is much more excellent than theirs. For... To which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, though, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Look at verse 13. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not they all? Ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Look at the beginning of chapter 2. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received its just retribution, how shall we escape If we neglect such a great salvation, 
It was declared first by the Lord, then it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Nor son of man that you care for him. You made him for him? you made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything under uh, in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everybody. Look at verse 16. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. May God bless this word in our midst and to his glory. The big idea is that Jesus, and you've seen it there, is more supreme than angels. He is better than angels. The big question for us, though, is why is this such a good argument? Why is this the argument that opens up the book of Hebrews? Uh, why is it, as he's trying to argue throughout the whole book, the new covenant is, is calling us into its membership. Uh, we must see Jesus, see God as worshipped over and above, through, without, uh, 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 by uh, all God's people. Now, we don't need to go back to the temple. How is saying angels don't compare to Jesus a good argument to accomplish his end? That's it's a fairly confusing line of thought for uh, people raised Gentiles, sort of uh, Western evangelicals. Well, here's the idea. The reason it made such an enormous, powerful argument and polemic for the early Christians was that the, early, the, the, the first century Jews, still Jews today, and the Jews of ancient Moses' day, they rightly believed that not only does Jesus have to compete with Moses, David, and the Levites, and others, that the writer of the Hebrews will go and show that Jesus is better than he also has to compete with the angelic realm who have very much to do with this old covenant system. You see, in the Jewish theology of the day, they had believed that the whole old covenant system was delivered to Moses up on Mount Sinai by angels. That sometimes we see sort of Moses in the presence of God's glory and it's veiled uh, other times, though, we just hear that he went up into the cloud, into the fire, into the midst of God's presence, and came down with books upon books of revelation and laws. And Jewish tradition developed the idea that it was angels delivering those words to Moses, delivering him the blueprints for the tabernacle that he saw in heaven. It was angels communicating to Moses. And the New Testament writers affirm that tradition as actually historically true. So Galatians 3 says this in verse 19. Paul's speaking about the old covenant law, and he says it was put in place through angels. In Acts chapter 7, when Stephen the deacon is open air preaching at his own trial, it's a way to go. If you know they're going to kill you anyway, he steps up onto the witness stand and just is yelling at the top of his lungs, you killed Jesus. Our people have always been disobedient to God. You've done it again. You killed the Messiah, but there is salvation. I see him at God's right hand, and they throw rocks at him until he dies. But in his uh, tirade against their sin and in his preaching of the gospel, he says, <coughs> you have received the law as delivered from angels yet you refused to obey it. Now, the problem was not that they thought that angels delivered the law. The problem is thinking that they then disobeyed it. Or in Hebrews chapter 2, which we just read, in verse 2, it calls the old covenant system and everything received through Moses, it calls that the message declared by angels. And even you're familiar with your Old Testament history, you know that angels visited Abram and Sarah. Uh, a, a, a angels uh, uh, saved Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, angels uh, were, were envisioned uh, by Jacob on the ladder that he uh, saw in a vision. Uh, uh, angels were a, 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 not a common occurrence, but a special occurrence who attended to the receivers of the Old Testament uh, covenant. And even it was embedded into the tabernacle. God told them to, to weave and sew pictures of angels and the curtains in the tabernacle. 
And then on the Ark of the Covenant, which only the high priest would ever see, there is two golden uh, angels sitting upon that mercy seat before God's presence. So it was meant to uh, truly symbolize. So angels were all throughout the Old Covenant uh, theology and the Old Covenant reception and inhabitation, but also the protection. The Jews believed that they, as God's covenant people, and the covenant delivered by Moses was kept sort of a, uh, by divine security guards by angels. There's a great uh, story in the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 19 when the Assyrian king Sennacherib brings up uh, uh, 200,000 soldiers to uh, Jerusalem's door and he mocks Yahweh and he uh, smack talks all of the uh, Hebrews and the Israelites and the Jews and says they're going to die. We've destroyed every other kingdom, every other main city, every other little God has bowed down to us at the edge of our sword. Yahweh will be no different. Your petty, pathetic, made up God will bow to Sennacherib, our king. And it is that night that Hezekiah humbles himself and prays and the prophet Isaiah receives a message that they will not enter God's city, Jerusalem. In the morning, they wake up and they look out over uh, the uh, expanse, over the plain, and they see that the army that had once besieged the city, locking everybody in, allowing nobody out, there was now 185,000 slain soldiers, which the scriptures tell us was the handiwork of merely one angel from heaven sent to protect the city. So yes, the Old Covenant had much to do with angels, and it was definitely a glorious thing. Upon that biblical history, they also developed a tradition. You know, in pagan religions like Egyptology and, and, and Norse mythology and things like that, and Romanism, and what they, they sort of have gods allocated to different sections. They have the rain god, the sea god, the agriculture god, the fertility god, the blonde god, the brunette god, and whatever. In, in, in Jewish theology and angelology, they developed some of that. Now, they weren't polytheists, they weren't worshipping multiple gods, but they thought that God had distributed his whole world to be upkept and upheld and reigned over by territorial angels. The, the, the sea angel, the agriculture angel, the male angel, the female's angel, the mother's angel, the father's, you know, and so it went. That's unbiblical. Also, we see that they had begun even in some regional areas. This doesn't seem at all to be the problem with Jerusalem-centered, Israel-centered, uh, located Jews. But in the Hellenistic Jews, that is the Jews who would visit Jerusalem for the holy days, but who lived among the Roman Empire and the Greco-Roman world, they had started mixing their theology in the Bible, with the philosophy of the Greeks and started to see that that maybe angels being so exalted and elevated and only merely removed from God by a few degrees should also be worshipped. So they worshipped angels, some of these regional, rural, or at least uh, non-Judah living Jews were worshipping angels. To the Christians then, or to every other religion, this was the first century Jewish mindset. Every other religion is man-made and demon-inspired. Our religion alone is God-breathed, delivered by angels, inhabited by angels, uh, and protected by angels. What in the world does Jesus, the homeless, rural carpenter who died publicly under the Romans, what kind of comparison does he have with a grand multitude of holy angels, the hosts of the Lord, who protect and inhabit and glorify and exalt our religion? And the answer of the writer of Hebrews that we will see in chapter 1 and 2 is that the angels you regard so highly, they worship somebody. They worship God. And Jesus is the God they're bowing down to and worshipping. So come and join them and worship Jesus. That's the argument of Hebrews chapter 1. That is the truth we will uh, fill our hearts and minds with today. (laughs) So we're going to look, like the writer of the Hebrews, we do not disparage angels. We do not blaspheme angels, as the book of Jude tells us. That the writer of the Hebrews does not disparage the angels. He merely says that for all of their wonder and resplendent glory... They are not Jesus. And they're they're not Jesus because they're not this, they're not that, they're not this, they're not that. So we're going to go through six things that angels, for all their wonder, are not. And see how Jesus, in fact, is. So the first thing is, look at verse 5. The angels are not the Son. They are not called 
the Son of God. So verse five says, uh, verse four says he has a better name than them. Verse five then quotes Psalm two and Second Samuel to say God calls his son his son. He says, "You are my son. I have begotten you. You are from my nature. You are you are you are you are you are very much like me." In person, you are me by nature. There is, a, there is a unification of Jesus to God because he partakes in and fully exhausts the divine attributes. We were looking at this last week. One thing I said last week is that some parts of the Old Testament do refer to angels as the sons of God. But if we look at that a little bit closer, even that is giving it too much. Uh, uh, that's pretty liberal. Because there's only two verses in the Old Testament which call angels the sons of God. One of them is in Job, which is... Uh, a, 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 contra- a, a, a controversial text. In other words, some people think that's just referring to uh, a, a men of God, uh, the, the high exalted men on earth, similar in Genesis. And then there's Daniel, in which the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar says that the man in the furnace with the, the martyrs that he threw in looks like one of the sons of God, when we know it was an angel of the Lord, or the angel of the Lord. So it's not as if there's this vast expanse of texts where the Old Testament commonly calls the angels sons. But even with those maybe verses, not in none of those places does God identify or pull aside one angel and say, you are my son. He never does that. It is a world of difference between what the Old Testament shows us and what God says to his son. Are they messengers of God? Absolutely. Are they sons of God? Are they the son of God, begotten from his very nature, partaking in his full essence? Uh, As verse two says, uh, sorry, verse three says, the radiance of his glory and the exact imprint of his nature, far from it, far from it. They are none of these things. There's actually uh, underlying this uh, kind of uh, Jewish Era, uh, many of the Gentiles in other cha- you know, books of the New Testament which get addressed, underlying it is this kind of Greek mythology, this Greek uh, uh, theology and philosophy, which basically saw uh, all being, all things that have existence, exist on a spectrum of being. That is that at the very top end of the spectrum, right out at the front, the greatest, the highest, the most wonderful, pure being is God. This thing we will call God. And what is so great about him is that he is timeless. He's bodiless. He doesn't have uh, flesh or meat or space or material like we do because that's evil, but he's perfect, holy, pure, undefiled, and amazingly powerful. And then maybe one degree beneath him is another God that is sort of the shadow of his existence, so much like him, but not quite him. And they really just do this down a huge emanation they call the pleroma of gods. Uh, They say there's just almost infinite degradations of this this divine being until you get so low that you might as well just call them angels. And these angels are far less powerful. They are spiritual, but they can take on physical form, which is not good. So they're farther down the track. You go down from angels a little bit and you find humans. And we are like the divine being in the sense that we can rationally think, argue, debate, have beauty. Uh, We can love one another. We have that, but we are encased and trapped in flesh. So we're a fair way down the spectrum of being. And then then beneath us is the animals, the, uh, you know, Victorians, people who, uh, they they can't, they can't reason, they can't relate, they have no, uh, you understand. Uh, So, you know, beneath humans will be animals, carnal create creatures with no rational minds. Then beneath them would be demons, and so you would go on basically until you get to the black void of non-existence. Here's that big idea. The pantheists or panentheists, everything exists in the one realm of being. There's only one kind of being. The question is, where do you exist on this line of being? That's the Greek Greco-Roman sort of philosophical, classical understanding of all things that exist. So when, when they talked about religion, it was a matter of trying to connect to the angels and through them to the ultimate God so that when you die, you ultimately go and partake in his nature, in his, in his immaterialness and in his immortality. Where this goes wrong is that the scripture teaches us of an all-important, uncrossable divide. And that is the distinction, the divide between creator and creature. 
The Bible teaches us that there is not one kind of being. We're all in that on a spectrum. There is two kinds of being, and you can't cross between them. Those two kinds of being is an uncreated, infinite being that is unchangeable and eternal. And then there is the created, finite beings, which can change, die, uh, mutate, and uh, sure, evolve in some way. But they can never go beyond their, uh, their createdness into the uncreated category. They can never arise up out of being finite and find themselves infinite. You can never go from having a beginning and progress into the divine being so much that now you don't have a beginning. Those things are not a matter of power, but a matter of logical contradiction. This is very important, in fact, for the whole Christian true worldview or view of the entire world. We do not believe that we are like God just further down the track. We believe that there is infinite, uncrossable, unspannable divide between the essence of God and the essence of all other things. The creature-creator distinction. The way that God reaches down to us is not, not by becoming less so that he can be with us. The way that we relate to God is not by becoming God and partaking in his divine attributes and nature. Tell that to your Eastern Orthodox friends. We are not deified. God is not humanized. He bridges it by speaking to us and then coming into our nature, not changing his divine nature in the incarnation. We're going to go into this in further weeks as Hebrews unfolds the glory of this mystery. But the fact is, there is the creator and there is the creature. The question becomes this. On which side do you put the angels and on which side do you put Jesus? Jesus belongs in the category of uncreated, infinite, eternal being. Angels exist for all their glory. Even put them at the top of the category if you want. They're still in the category of created, finite beings. Some Greek mythology, some uh, Roman philosophy, some uh, Jewish philosophy, some early Christian Gnostics, they saw this big spectrum of being and said, you know, Jesus is right at the top of the angels, one degree underneath divinity, one degree above the angels. That's where he is. Others of them saw him far, but he was one of the lower angels, but he's the one we need to relate to to find salvation. And the writer of the Hebrews is saying, there is an enormous divide between he who partakes in the essence of the Son of God and angels. They are not the same thing. To no angel did God ever say, you belong with me in the category of divine, eternal, infinite, and uncreated. Only Jesus, the Son of God, has ever heard those words from his Father, for only of him is it true. Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, kind of Mormons, uh, any other group that tries to put Jesus in the greatest and best angel category is breaking apart the New Testament and committing high-handed blasphemy. Jesus is no such thing. He is truly God. So the angels are never called son because they don't partake in God's essence or being. Secondly, though, they are never worshipped. Look at verse 6. Angels, for all their wonder, are never worshipped. Verse 6 refers to the same event that the quotation from Psalm 97 refers to, which is when God again brings the firstborn into the world, that is, at the second coming of Jesus, at the return of the God-man, the inheritor of the entire world, the firstborn. When Jesus comes back into the world... Psalm 97 prophesies that the Father will say, let all God's angels worship him. Jesus is to be worshipped, but that is forbidden of angels. It is forbidden for us to worship angels. For example, we have Matthew chapter 4, when uh, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, we're told the greatest angel, it seems, if we draw our theology from the Old Testament and understand probably the prophetic, symbolic uh, history of Lucifer, it is that he was the greatest angel, led a rebellion against God, was cast to earth. He tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, the, the other fallen angels who are condemned by God are nonetheless given a, a level of power and influence upon the world to lie, to deceive, to afflict and infect with, uh, with demonic power. But Jesus, when he's fasting in the desert, Satan comes up to him and says, look, God gave this whole thing into my hand. I've been ruling it fairly well, keeping sinners 
thoroughly damned and condemned, hating their life, destroying themselves and blaspheming God. Jesus, here's the offer I make to you. Just do what they all do. Bend the knee, worship me, and I will fulfill what God has promised you. Here's the catch. I don't have to make you go to the cross. This is all you need. You've come for the kingdoms. You've come to save the world, to redeem all creation. That's fine. Have it. Don't go to the cross. Just bend the knee, utter the words, hold your fingers crossed behind your back if you want, Jesus, but say the words, Satan is Lord. Worship me. Now, Jesus' response was not, as the Jehovah's Witnesses would have us believe, it should have been, Jesus' response was not, no, Satan, brother, Lucifer, pal, There's only one angel we're supposed to worship. He doesn't say, no, there's only the greater angel than you who we are supposed to or allowed to worship alongside God. That's not what he says. He says, quoting Deuteronomy, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. So so there is no worship of angels because we only worship God and no angel is God. And why do we worship Jesus? Jesus. Because he's not an angel, he is God. Colossians 2 verse, 18, uh, one, uh, 2 verse 18 speaks to the Christians who are being tempted by this Gnostic teaching. And Paul says, let no one disqualify you, insisting on the worship of angels. And then we see that in Revelation, when John the Apostle, I would bet if, well, I would reason that it seems like he was maybe the last living apostle at the time. If that's the case, and I think it is, that he was receiving this revelation, we could bet he's the holiest dude on the entire planet, all right? So let's just put him up there on that category before we go to this story. Then Jesus appears to him, and he sort of falls down as if dead, and God, Jesus raises him back up so that he can receive the revelation. And then he sort of gets a divine tour guide through the heavenly apocalypse uh, by an angel, and an angel is showing him all of the things that are to, to, to take place and, and occur. And John, after chapters and chapters of seeing God's presence, of witnessing Jesus, of worshiping Jesus, in chapter 19, after seeing all of these wonderful things, the most holy man on all the earth reports this of himself. I fell down at the angel's feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. How glorious, how vibrant and amazing must the presence of an angel be that in heaven, John, who's just seen God not too long ago, seeing the angel is still in his earthly human side, compelled with something more visceral than a decision, it seems. He throws himself down and begins to worship the divine presence of the angel. How glorious must they look for an apostle to make that mistake? And the angel says, and I understand the angel because he's probably seen what happens to demons who take worship from God. I mean, Revelation is largely about the judgment and blood that is thrown upon the earth because of idolatry. Here's the angel, not, not, not appreciating, have a huge target drawn on his back for being worshipped in heaven. That's, that's a pretty dangerous uh, uh, time for an angel to be worshipped uh, uh, if you know the judgment of God. So he's scared of that. He says, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. What's his command? Worship God. And then, just to drive it home, John does it again. Three chapters later to the verse, he says again, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed all these things to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. He's really afraid he's about to get whacked. Uh, His report is going to come back to the Lord of hosts and he's going to get an F on his mission. He got worshipped twice while he was supposed to be pointing to Jesus. He goes, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. How inappropriate it is. And angels feel this burn the most to worship an angel. God alone must Be worshipped. So in Revelation 5, we see millions of angels worshipping Jesus on the throne. And in chapter 1, verse 6 in Hebrews, we see that Jesus is commanded, uh, the angels are commanded to worship Jesus. For all their wonder, angels are never worshipped. Look at verse 7. There's something else about angels. For all their wonder, they are not 
ministered to. They are not ministered to. They are not helped. They are not served. Look at what verse 7 says. He makes his angels winds and his ministers or his servants a flame of fire. Angels are the most incomprehensibly glorious servants of God. They do his bidding. They administer his justice and judgment in the old covenant. They deliver his messages. They run his errands. They answer prayers for him. They, they serve God and they are the most glorious, amazing. I mean, the, 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 the imagery is mixed here to give us such a, a multifaceted glory. He's, they're winds. Imagine a grand hurricane or tornado tearing through a valley. But they're winds of fire. Have you seen any of those, uh, those uh, uh, videos of maybe a tornado striking a gas petrol station and, and up in flames engulf the entire tornado and it looks like something apocalyptic? God has chosen that kind of imagery to say, they're, they're the people who serve me in my presence. These ministers of fiery winds. And yet, for all their flaming tornado glory, they are just servants. They're, they're the ministers. They're the waiting staff of God's presence, there's someone much more glorious than them, which is the one that they're worshiping. Who is who? The next verse tells us. But of the son, he says, your throne, so he's a king, O God, so he's God, is forever and ever, so he's unchanging and eternal. Angels are amazing. They minister in glorious flaming ways. They give justice and judgment out in, in incomprehensible wonder, but they serve somebody on a throne, and that throne isn't inhabited by an angel. It's inhabited by Jesus, who is God. In fact, verse 14 goes on to say that not only do we not worship or serve angels, nor does Jesus serve the angels. Nothing serves the angels. The angels serve the king, Jesus, O God, who is on a throne forever and ever, and in him they serve us. Is it angels, these fiery servants of God, serve the king and his kingdom purposes? Well, if you're in Jesus Christ by faith, you're a kingdom member, a citizen of heaven, and you are thereby in Christ served by the angels. It sounds, I, I hope we're sort of touching close to the Jewish mentality of angels here. I hope that as I said that, angels serve you, you get at least a shiver up your spine saying, is that at least a little bit blasphemous? Well, maybe one of those Sennacherim murderous angels come down and slay all of us just for saying that. There's not 185,000 of us, but he could do it in a quick moment. Now, verse 14 tells us this, that angels serve you and I. Verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? That is that anybody with faith is somebody inheriting salvation and the angels are sent out to serve us. It doesn't say that we send them out at our beck and call. They don't answer to us. They answer to Jesus, the King, O oh God, enthroned forever. But who does he tell them to serve? He tells them to serve you and I in the pursuit of the building of the church and the fulfilling of the Great Commission. There's stories all throughout church history that you would love to, you'd love to just compile and chronicle and read one after another. And some of them sort of pop up in missionary stories uh, where, where there is an angelic salvation, an angelic intervention to the people of God. Uh, one guy who has told these stories, his name is John G. Patton. And in the 1850s, he went to Vanuatu, which then was called the New Hebrides. He went there. And one of the reasons I'm inclined to believe him was because he was the most likely person to be discredited or disbarred from his denomination for saying miraculous things about angels. But there, there are some denominations out there where if you come into church or back from the mission field with some cooked up, pipe dream, opioid-induced story of how the angels did our groceries and we floated along the heavens and we skated on the fire, the people will worship you and praise you as the next apostle. That's not Scottish Presbyterianism. Okay? And that was, that was John G. Payton's denomination. Scottish Presbyterianism. They, would, they don't believe in anything that isn't written down in black and white, probably the original Greek and Hebrew. 
They are book people. They are Bible people. They are cessationists theologically. And John G. Payton came back to them with stories that would entail miraculous salvation at the hand of God in defense of the savages seeking to take his life and the life of other missionaries. There's one story since you asked. There's one story uh, where John G. Payton has, uh, this is after his wife has perished just a couple of months after landing on the island, uh, but there was a, uh, another couple who came to serve alongside him, and they were in this little thatch house roof, straw and uh, a wood, uh, constructing this small house, which was connected by a sort of a straw wood ha- uh, pathway to the church uh, that they had built for the sake of worship alongside the converts who had believed upon Christ. And the savages came and they surrounded at nighttime the church and the house, and they set the church on fire. And as the, the, the straw and the, the hay and the wood was uh, beginning to engulf the building, uh, the, the, the savages lined up outside uh, in order to kill those who tried to escape the house because, of course, as the church burned, it would travel over also to the connected house that they were in. So John G. Payton, he, uh, after praying with the couple, he musters strength. He grabs his revolver. I like this guy. He grabs his revolver and his tomahawk. He stands at the door and he pleads with his brother and sister in Christ to lock the door after him. They, almost conv- they try to convince him not to go out. He convinces them. He goes out. They lock the door for their own safety. And he runs around the side of the church in the dark. And he starts to pull off the thatched walling that connected the house to the church so that the fire might not travel across to the house. And he's gotten one large panel down and he's going. And then he sees shadows behind him. And as he turns around, there's a group of eight men savages, tomahawks and spears, ready to kill him. And he uh, uh, tells them that to harm him is to fight with Jehovah. We have done nothing but bring peace, love, grace and blessings to you. Do not harm me or you will be picking a fight with the Lord of hosts. He goes around and he starts to, to keep on tearing it down and one man grabs him and John pulls out his revolver, good missionary, and points it in his chest and says, To stop the work here, to kill us, to murder us, is to receive the judgment of the Lord of hosts whose angels stand at his beck and call in heaven. He bolsters that, holsters that, and keeps on tearing it down. And at this point, he says in the story that these savages cheer to one another, go kill him. And one would try, but but they're frozen. They they can't move forwards. And then the other one would, I will kill him. And and they couldn't move forwards upon. Now, they don't know what's happening. You and me, we read our Bible. We know what's happening. They don't know what's happening. And then in the moment as as John was finally separating uh, the house from the church building, an enormous cloud filled with thunder, though no lightning, engulfed the mountain that they were on from the sea and poured down upon their local area this enormous torrential rainfall which put out the fire of the church and scared these hardened savages, these these uh, 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 cannibals away from the missionaries yelling, this is Jehovah's storm. And off they went. The angels were employed that day. And there's another story that John tells of his second wife and he uh, on an island. Uh, a very similar story. In the, the house at night, savages surround them, start chanting for their death. And as uh, John and his dear wife, this time, not a single guy not about to grab the revolver and his wife and go pick a fight. They stay inside and he starts praying Psalm 91 with his wife. The Lord, protect us under the shelter of his wings. Send the angels so that not a stone hurts our feet. They're praying the promises of God. And all night, these savages remain there. And at daybreak, they leave. And a year later, the story goes, and this story was first published in an Australian newspaper after John G. Payton's uh, visit to Australia. The story goes by John's witness that uh, a year later, those men, along with their chief, was converted. And sort of, I guess you can imagine it happening here with a testimony before baptism. And and, and one quick thing that Pastor John asks them is, "Just, just by the way, a year ago, when you surrounded us, why did you not attack? And the man uh, answers fairly logically. He goes, I don't know what you mean. I mean, you had a hundred white soldiers with you with large swords. We weren't going we to risk our lives for that. 
Because white soldiers, now you know, what, you know what this is. You know the context of this story. You know why I'm telling it. He's going, what do you mean white soldiers? Like he's thinking Brits or Scots here. with my, like the, the British didn't send any cavalry. What are you talking about? This is a, the glowing white men with, 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 with tall uh, statues and the large swords. They didn't have muskets. They weren't British. The, the white men who shone white, they, they stood there. We couldn't come near you. John G. Patton realized that as he prayed in the physical realm, sending prayers in the spiritual realm, he was blind to the spiritual realm around him, wherein God had sent angels to protect them. This is not something you're promised when you can't find a park at the shopping center at Sunday lunch. (laughs) This is not the kind of thing we send out for our own sake, but we have the comfort that he who does all things well, Jesus, sends angels to do his bidding for our sake as we seek and serve Jesus' sake. They serve us, they are not served. Look at verse five in chapter two for another quick one. Chapter five, it is not the angels who are the lords of the new creation. When the new heavens and earth are made by Jesus at his return, uh, he is not going to recreate an angelic world with clouds and cupids and harps. Sorry if you're into classical music and medieval art. Uh, He's not going to create an angelic world that we get to be part of. He's not going to create an angelic world where we serve our angelic overlords. He's going to create a human world. He's going to create a new heavens and new earth fit for us just as the first world was before sin. He's going to create that world for Jesus and with Jesus all those who are in him, the saved people, and is the angels who will not there receive an upgraded status. So verse 5 says, It was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. The, The glorious world to come is not designed to be ruled over by angels, but by Christ and his people with him. That is quite a thought. Or we can look at the next thing in verse uh, 7, where he's quoting Psalm 8. But he says, you made mankind, you made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, what Psalm 8 does is kind of tell, give us a glimpse into uh, the meta-narrative of humankind. And the meta-narrative of humankind is we are created in God's likeness. We fall into sin. By nature, we're mortal. By sin, we are depraved. Uh, In this life, then, we are decaying. We are mortal. We are full of shame, and we are dying. However, those who in Jesus Christ have been saved have a future re-glorification. We have an end times when Jesus comes back This is the day of the resurrection, the new heavens and the new earth of which we were just speaking. We have a future glory, a future time when we will become incorruptible, undefilable, indestructible, immortal. We will become glorified into a body just like Jesus' body, into the kind of body, C.S. Lewis says, that if you saw somebody now, the way they would look in heaven, you too, like John, would be tempted to worship. We are going to be crowned with glory and honor, given incorruptibility and sinlessness. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody. That's going to be an amazing, glorious day and eternal day. uh, Psalm 8 sort of tells that story. The reason that writer of the Hebrews hints at that story is that he says, we've got a different timeline to angels. See, angels are created with glory and wonder and awe right now. But in the world to come, they won't be the most resplendent, beautiful, glorious thing anymore. Uh, right now, I don't know, this is my experience. I'm going to g- guess it's yours. I've never had somebody fall at my feet, tempted to worship me as, as God for my appearances. Never happened. Never happened. Now, though, even the holiest man on earth would be tempted to worship an angel. I'm saying the roles are going to be reversed in the new heavens and the new earth. That if you were to see an angel then and a human then alongside, you would say the human He made and remade in the image of God and of his son is the more glorious being. He has been crowned with decay and death now. He is crowned with glory and honor and all things in the whole world, including angels in the new world, are subject to the the new humanity's feet in heaven. That's an amazing thing. Psalm 8, though, is then explained to us with a Jesus-focused application in uh, verse 8 and 9 here in the book of Hebrews, 
He actually explains how this is about us, but it's also about Jesus. Now, look, Psalm 8 is about us, but it's also about Jesus. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, that is, I think, humankind, he left nothing out of his control. He gave us dominion over all things. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. You do not tell angels what to do. You do not command the created realm and find it obeying you. No, we are not, as presently, Christ has not brought us to that stage in salvation history where all things are subjected to us. But we do see him, Jesus, verse 9 says, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. Do you see, Psalm 8 tells us humankind is, is decaying and dishonorable, then we will be crowned with glory and honor. Angels are now glory and honorable and then will not have a comparative glory and honor. But Jesus Christ has also come in and fulfilled Psalm 8. As our great representative and the savior of humankind, he became one of us and lived a time lower than the angels, Psalm 8 says. He was for a time subject to death, suffering, brutality, and lies. He had to grow up, he had to learn, he had to be hungry and then eat, he had to work hard, he had to sweat, and he bled. Jesus was made lower than the angels. They ministered to him, but they looked far more glorious than him as far as his human appearance went. Jesus wore the crown of thorns on earth. He, will wear the, he currently wears the crown of glory in heaven. Jesus was made lower than the angels for his earthly ministry, what theologians call his humiliation, but his exaltation occurred at the resurrection and his ascension to the throne of God so that what will be true of humanity Meta narrative: we fell, we were uh, uh, humble, then we will be glorified, happened to Jesus in his short earthly ministry. He was made humble, he died, then he rose gloriously, and that's where we're going one day too. Where do the angels play in there though? Nowhere near as glorious as you and I will be in the world to come. And nowhere near as glorious as Jesus is presently right now being worshipped by angels. That's the point of him quoting Psalm chapter 8. And then verse 16 tells us, if we've learned that angels are not the sons of God, angels are never worshipped, angels are not ministered to, angels are not the lords of the new creation, angels are not crowned with glory and honor like us, and angels are not helped by Jesus. Verse 16, for surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Look at verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Why did Jesus not suffer on earth with wings, glorious light shining out of his face, uh, maybe like a cherubim with different angels and creatures being uh, 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 seen in his being with claws and a lion's head? Why? Because Jesus didn't die for angels. Why wasn't Jesus embodied into an angelic form throughout his whole life? Because Jesus didn't take on the nature of angels because he wasn't saving angels. Why didn't Jesus come and preach good news to those demons who, who screamed and, 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 and shrunk back at his very presence? Why didn't he tell them, it's okay, I've come to save you? Because he didn't come to save demons. Angels don't ever taste the redemptive grace of God. That is an exclusive gift offered to mankind. Angels are not served by Jesus, they serve Jesus. But by Jesus' incarnation and his death in our place on the cross and his wonderful resurrection back into our nature and his being sealed and seated in heaven at God's right hand as the God on the throne forever and ever, there he doesn't redeem or save or, 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 or bring forgiveness for angels. They have none. It is only the sons of Abraham he helps, verse 16 says. Now, what does it mean to be a son of Abraham? In this context, it doesn't mean a genetic uh, son or grandson of the Jewish line. To be a son of Abraham means somebody like Abraham, not like angels. Somebody like Abraham is somebody with flesh and blood. So Jesus took on flesh and blood. Somebody who sins. That's why Jesus became sin for us. Somebody who trusts in God for his salvation in Jesus, just like Abraham looked forward into the future according to God's promises and trusted that there would be salvation for his sins. To be a son of Abraham means that you are somebody who God can save. And to be a son of Abraham who God can save, you need to be a human sinner. So if that's you today, 
and you have not yet placed your faith in Jesus as God and as Savior of sinners, then you are not ready to face him as judge. And Jesus' word to you is, repent of your sins, believe in me, call on me, and receive all of my grace. Uh, throw away any silly philosophy, uh, New Ageism, self helpism other religions like Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses, or Mormonism that say that Jesus was tremendous and great and a good example, good philosopher. He embodied the Christ spirit, sure, oh, but he wasn't God himself. That is a damnable lie. He was God in flesh for our salvation. Receive him as that, or you do not receive him for salvation. And for us, the application is already made for us who believe. The beginning of chapter 2 says, if the message given by angels was met with punishment severe, how would we ever escape God's judgment if having received the message of Jesus from God himself, about God himself in our flesh, if we scrunch that up and throw it away for convenience sake or for the pleasures of sin, woe on us. Let us press in to the reality that Jesus delivers. Let's pray. God, the incarnation of your son into flesh like ours is a mystery that, that blows our categories out of the water. But it is such a condescension that it, it leaves you open for all kinds of misunderstanding. Jesus was, was able to be spat upon, mistreated, lied about, uh, even killed. And even now, Lord God, there are false teachers, there are demonic lies and demonically inspired religions which, which continually lie about you because of the man Christ Jesus who, who is truly you. Uh, and so, Lord God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would shine the light of your truth, that he would shine the light of the word of God into our hearts and our minds so that he would burn up and cast out any ignorance any disagreement, any resistance or reluctance to believe what is said this morning, or any sense of, 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 of misunderstanding or confusion about who Jesus is, would you burn those up and clarify them with the, with the divine light of Holy Scripture? We pray, Lord God, that for those of us who believe, those of us who are very unlikely tempted to go and worship angels this afternoon, yet, like our brothers and sisters of the first century, we are, we are apt to forget it, and we are, we are likely to shrink back, to slide back, to backslide in some measure. And Lord God, this is the great anchor for our souls, which hold us close to you. The confession, the knowledge, the faith that Jesus is God. And God in Jesus has reconciled us and given us a secure, eternal salvation. Please, Lord God, give to Jesus today more souls to believe in him. Converts people who are saved from their sin to Jesus, and in those who believe, Lord God, fill us with assurance, confidence, and zeal in serving Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his wonderful name. Amen.